like she said, my name is Sarah and I work at Nova Coast, which is a cybersecurity consulting firm. Um, but I do analytics and so I am a statistical person. I majored in engineering. I never really did anything with cybersecurity until about five years ago when I started working for a cybersecurity firm. Um, so just to preface, this talk is probably going to be a little bit different than any of the other talks today. I'm not going to be talking about like CVEs or how to hack anything because I don't even know how to. Um, but instead we're going to get a little bit mathematical and statistical and even throw in a little bit of psychology um, and, and kind of do a little bit more of a high level presentation. But I'll try to keep it really interesting. Um, there will be very slight audience participation but it'll be cool. Um, and yeah, that's the plan. So at a high level, I'm going to start by talking about the ways that we currently assess risk in cybersecurity. I'm going to talk about what's good about them, what's bad about them, and then propose some other ways to do it. Um, but before we really dive into that, I want to start by defining cyber risk, right? What even is it? And I think to do that, you actually first really have to define what risk is in general. Um, and cyber risk, just like a risk in life, is basically any time something is unknown, right? Like any time you have a risk in life, it's because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And when we think about cyber risk, it's kind of the same thing where we don't know if we're going to get breached tomorrow. We don't know if a vulnerability will get exploited, this or that, right? That's why we have to understand risk and understand how much as an organization or as a person you're willing to take on. Um, so at the end of the day, everything about risk is kind of a guess, right? How can we analyze data from the unknown? And how can we even get data if in theory a risk is something that we don't know the outcome of, right? So it kind of poses this question of, is guessing okay? And that's kind of what we're going to talk about in this presentation, right? Is guessing okay? And if so, how can we do it? And how can we do it better? And is that even possible? Um, but before I get into that, I want to talk about what we currently do a lot of in cybersecurity. Um, so everybody's probably seen this before, it's your pretty standard risk matrix, right? If you work at any type of company, especially in a cybersecurity profession, you're probably familiar with having to rate risks or even a typical vulnerability, right? If you've got a vulnerability scanner like Tenable or Follis, they're rating it low, medium, high, critical, right? How do we come up with these ratings? So let's talk about this risk matrix a little bit and um, I'm actually going to kind of tear it apart because a risk matrix or doing anything like this is what we call qualitative, not quantitative. And we'll kind of get into the difference of why we really want to be quantitative. Um, but the first way that we know that this is a qualitative or a non-quantitative scale is because it's what we call ordinal in nature. So an ordinal scale is something that has an implied order, right? Think low, medium, high, um, one through five, even though that's numeric, that's still ordinal, right? Not quantitative, just numeric, but it's ordinal in nature. Um, think of a user, like an admin user versus a normal user, that's also ordered, right? It has an implied order to it. So where this falls apart and why we can't call this quantitative is because ordinal doesn't necessarily mean you can do mathematical operations to it. So let's think again of an ordinal scale of like a one through five, right? And people want to call this quantitative because again, it's numbers, so you think quantitative. And if you rate critical or vulnerability number A, you know, a two, and then vulnerability num number B, a three, and it has a likelihood of one and whatever, criticality of four, a lot of times we multiply those or we add them, right? In spreadsheets, this is probably sounding familiar to some people. But the reason that that's wrong is because instead of one, two, three, four, or five, you could say what we've got up here on the chart, right? Improbable, seldom, occasional, likely, frequent. It doesn't make sense to multiply a seldom by a likely, right? So why does it make sense to multiply a two by a five? And that's how you know that a scale is ordinal and not quantitative in nature. If you can take your scale and replace the numbers with words like this, you're probably not using a quantitative method. And that's where the math starts to get really bad and everything kind of falls apart. So let's look at an example of this. Using this exact same risk matrix, and I haven't done anything crazy at all, we've got two risks that we're going to evaluate. We've got risk A and risk B. Risk A has a likelihood of 
and an impact of 9 million. Risk B has a likelihood of 60% and an impact of 2 million. So if we look at just the expected loss multiplying the two, you can see that risk B is a lot less likely than risk A, right? Risk A has over $4 million expected loss, risk B only has a 1.2. But if we use this scale, this totally normal scale, right? We would rate risk B as a high and risk A as a medium. So now, not only are we not understanding, you know, our risk to any like high degree of accuracy, but we are actually getting a worse understanding of our risk simply because of the tool that we're using to analyze it. So this is something called analysis placebo. Analysis placebo, in general, not even related to cybersecurity, is basically when the way or the tool or the equation or anything like that that you're using to analyze data gives you either no valuable insight into what the data really means or even a worse understanding than if you were to do no analysis at all. Right? In this case, it's actually giving us a worse understanding. And it's because of something called range compression. Um, so range compression, I'm just going to demonstrate by giving a real life example. Let's say I'm in charge of, you know, quantifying our risk or understanding our risk at the company. And I want to know what's the chance that we get breached in the next year. So I'm going to ask, I want to ask two people, get both of their opinions. So I'm going to ask our CISO and our CTO. And I'm going to say, you know, on a scale of one to five, what's the likelihood we get breached in the next year? So I go to our CISO, and our CISO is like, well, I'm doing everything right, and we're amazing, blah, 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 we've got all these tools. You know, there's probably only like a 3% chance we get breached in the next year. So they'll rate that a one on a scale of one to five. Okay. So I go to our CTO, and the CTO is like, yeah, the CISO is an idiot, and I don't know what we're doing, and everything's underfunded. So there's probably like an 18% chance we get breached in the next year. So they'll rate that a one on a scale of one to five. So they both agree there's a one on a scale of one to five chance of getting breached in the next year. But anyone in cybersecurity knows there's actually a huge difference between a 3% and an 18% chance you get breached in the next year, right? Um, so that's called range compression, right? We're not getting as clear of an understanding as we can. But how do we fix that, right? Now that I've kind of said, you know, some of the methods that we're using to understand risk and stuff might not be the best statistically, what can we do to fix it? Especially given that we don't have a lot of input data normally. And that's typically why we're using scales like this, because we feel like we can't get to a granular, you know, 4.3% chance of getting breached in the next year because we don't have that type of input data to know that granularly, right? So before we get into the method of how to fix it, we're gonna do a little experiment, but I promise, like I said, it'll kind of be fun. And we're gonna figure out, are you a good guesser? Um, because if we don't have all the input data in the world, and if inherently risk means we don't know the answer to something, so we're gonna be guessing, right? Can we figure out if we're good guessers? And if we're not, can we become better guessers? And this is where the psychology comes in a little bit. So I promise it won't be bad. I'm not making you download an app or anything. But if you go to menti.com and just put in this code, we are going to do a little experiment. So I'll leave the code up there for a second. And I believe um, it'll also be on the So don't choose anything yet, but just go to Menti and put in this code. And I'll leave it up here for one more second, but it'll be up later too if you don't get it right now. Um, but I like to think that I'm like a pretty good judge of character. I can kind of read, you know, read the room, know what people are into and what they're not. And I can just tell that this room specifically, everyone's probably a really big fan of The Bachelor. Um, you know, I can just, I, I just get that vibe from you all. Um, and so, <laughs> I'm going to ask the question, how many seasons of The Bachelor has there been? Okay. But before you think of an answer to this, I just want to give a huge shout out. I like to stay true to myself. Um, yes, I'm in cybersecurity and do this and that, but I love reality television. I think it's hilarious. I love watching The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And I just want to give a quick plug and say, if you have not watched it and you think it's stupid, I promise you, get a bottle of wine, okay? Sit down, drink the whole bottle, watch the two hour episode. <laughs> By the end of it, you will feel so much better about your life. Like, um, like I, I, can't, I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> but, so I want everyone to think about the answer to this question, right? Don't Google it, think about it, you're gonna guess how many seasons of their Bachelor have there been. 
But instead of just thinking of a specific number, I want you guys to think of what we call your 95% confidence interval, right? So that means think of a lower bound and an upper bound, that you're 95% sure, actually let's do 90, sorry, I think I'm supposed to do 90. Yes, I am. 90% confidence interval. You're 90% sure the true answer to this question falls in between, right? About a 10% chance you're wrong, but 90% sure you're probably right, okay? So everyone think of your interval. And now let's play a little game. So let's say I'm going to give you the chance to win $1,000. And I did not, unfortunately, get the funding to approve to actually play this. So this is a hypothetical $1,000. Um, and I'm going to give you two options to, to potentially win this $1,000. Option number one, if the real answer to the question, how many seasons of The Bachelor had there been, was in the interval you thought of, you win $1,000, not you don't. Option number two, you spin the wheel. Lands on green, you win $1,000, if not you don't, okay? Gut reaction, which would you pick, right? Would you spin the wheel? Would you go with your confidence interval, or do you not care, right? And it's not a trick question at all, it's just gut reaction, okay? And now we're gonna go over to Mentimeter here. And I want everyone to go ahead and say which option you would choose. Again, not for question at all. Just curious. I want to, it's kind of fun to do, you know, audience participation. If you didn't get the code, it is at the top still. And then I'll also do a quick plug. If anyone does presentations a lot, Mentimeter is free and really good for, like, live polling audiences. I don't work for them. They don't pay me to say that. It's just a cool tool. All right. So I'll let a couple guesses come in here. Remember, this is kind of like, what was your gut reaction, right? Okay, so pretty 50-50 split, about half of you would go with your confidence interval, half would spin the wheel. Okay, good to know. We'll come back to that. So, I'm not going to leave you hanging. I will tell you, the true answer is 26. There have been 26 seasons of The Bachelor. That does not include The Bachelorette, Bachelor Pad, Bachelor in Paradise, Bachelor Winter Games, none of those. There's more, but I'll spare you. Um, just The Bachelor, there's been 26 seasons, right? Okay, so let's go back to Menti one more time. And let's go to the next slide. Was the correct answer in your original confidence interval? Yes or no? Be honest. It'll be interesting. the answer was no, the original answer was not in your confidence interval. So here's why I made you do that. Let's go back here. Now, if we were truly a perfectly what we call calibrated audience, meaning if we were good guessers inherently, 90% of you, think about that, should have had the right answer in your confidence interval, right? So 83% didn't, but 90% should have, only 10% should have. Which means, and I'm not surprised, we are a very what we call overconfident group. Um, and that's actually human nature. So they've done a lot of studies in psychology on this. Humans tend to be very, what we call, overconfident inherently. And by that it means, you know, if you truly gave your 90% confidence interval, you should have had no preference between spinning the wheel or picking the confidence interval, right? Because in your head, both should have represented a 90% chance of winning. Okay, so that's actually a really well-known um, psychological tool to become better estimators and better guessers. It's if you evaluate a monetary loss in your head with your estimate, you actually psycho like psychologically become better at estimating it because you basically, if, if, you, if you said on the vote, I want to spin the wheel, right? You should increase your confidence interval until you have no preference between the two. But if you said, I want to go with my confidence interval, you should shrink the interval until you have no preference between the two. And that's how, in your head, you actually give your true 90% confidence level. Instead of what you guys all actually gave on average was your, what did we say, 17% confidence interval. Is what on average the audience gave when I asked for 90%, right? And so, where do we go from that? I know that was a super random tangent, but we're going to apply it. <laughs> so, we're going to talk about the one-to-one -one substitution to a uh, risk matrix and how we're going to use that 90% confidence interval to, to do this. So I'm talking about here just a simple one-to-one -one substitution for your typical risk matrix that's going to give us a better understanding of risk. 
The reason I say it's a one-to-one -one substitution, you don't need any additional software. I'm assuming if you make a risk matrix in Excel, you can do this in Excel. You don't need any additional input data. The input data you had for your risk matrix will do fine for this, right? Nothing additional needed. It's just a different way of analyzing your risk. So we're going to do what's called a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, same input sources, but it's actually a statistical model. Some of you might know Monte Carlo. It's not anything too crazy or complex. But it accounts for limited input data in uncertain events. So Monte Carlo takes ranges of values as its input in an equation instead of, for example, just one variable. And that's where we're going to use those 90% confidence intervals. And we're going to do thousands and thousands and thousands of replications on these in, you know, intervals that we're putting in. And we'll be able to get an average and get a lot of valuable information from that, which I'll show. But there is one interesting thing I want to point out. In a lot of our Monte Carlo simulations, specifically for cybersecurity, we're going to use what's called a log normal distribution. So taking everyone back to their college statistics class really quick, the red line here is a normal distribution, right, centered at zero, standard deviation of one. The blue line here is a log normal. The reason we're going to use this is because it better represents real life um, activities or events in cybersecurity for two reasons. Reason number one, it can't go below zero, which in real life translates to there's never a negative chance that we're going to get breached, right, as much as maybe we wish that there was. Um, and reason number two, you see a lot of the area under the curve, a lot of the density is very close to the axis. And there's a little tail out here at the end, but a lot is, is pretty close to zero. The reason that's good is because typically, even when companies do get breached, it's rarely the you know, $8 million breach that's on the news and this and that, the targets and the FFX and everything, right? It's rare. It happens. So we want to account for those extreme outliers, but we also want to say the majority of breaches require a couple days of remediation or a couple of help desk people wiping laptops or this and that, right? So we kind of want to account for all that range of possibilities. So here's what we're going to do. We're first going to define the risk, right? What is the risk we're trying to understand? I've been using the risk of getting breached because it's the highest level and it's very easy. But you could do any type of risk. Um, you could do the risk of you know, a phishing attack or something like that. Um, I did one for a company recently that they wanted to know the risk of allowing a personal email on company-owned devices. Right? So we, we simulated that risk for them. We figured it, you know, if they buy a DLP solution, how would that fix it, things like that. And then we want to define the time range. This is an important one because it actually logically doesn't make sense to say what's the probability you get breached. You have to say what's the probability you get breached in the next year or in the next month, right? Because those are two very different things. And then we're going to assign values with our confidence interval, right? So we're going to have all these inputs and we're going to use those 90% confidence intervals and become better calibrated guessers. Right? And there's actually a lot of different methods to become a better calibrated uh, guesser. I just showed one, which was monetary loss in your head, right? But there's many different psychological methods, and a lot of studies have shown that with you know, a couple hours of learning how to calibrate yourself, you can become an almost perfect guesser, meaning every time you give a 72% you know, confidence interval or whatever, it will actually be your 72%. So, Something interesting to look into just for life in general and not even cybersecurity. Um, you know, we're very overconfident. It's the reason that when your boss says, how long is this project going to take? And you say a week and then it takes five months, right? So it's kind of very helpful for things like that. Um, but we're going to assign our confidence at intervals. And then if possible, we're going to repeat with multiple people. So that's always just better for statistical accuracy, right? If we can get multiple people estimating risks, that's going to be better than just one. And then we're going to run our Monte Carlo and take an average. So I'm just going to show a really quick example of this. I think I'm kind of low on time, so I'll speed through it. But I did just want to show an example of, like, this can genuinely be done in Excel. I'm not proposing anything too insane or crazy. Um, so this is an example of, like, a phishing simulation. Um, this is just one I kind of made up. But think about a company in the technology industry with about 1,000 users, and they have about 10 million records. Right? So here's our input variables. We're going to assign all of our input variables, which basically just means what are the things that are going to affect the chance of getting fished, right? So here we've got things like 
um, likelihood, uh, or let's see, like number of users that click on a fish in a 12 month period. A lot of companies actually have that data because they run fishing simulations. So they can see, you know, on average, our, our click rate as a company is 22% or whatever, right? And then, you know, likelihood that um, the user actually requires response, remediation, recovery, something like that, if they do click on a fish. And then what's the hourly wage that we're paying someone who's doing that remediation? Let's account for those things, right? Um, business impact of a data breach, we actually can get that from industry reports. So if you think of like the Verizon data breach report, the IBM cost of a breach report is really good. But we can look at, for a company of this size, this industry with this many records, historically when breaches happen, how much on average are they costing? And we can kind of get those numbers, right? And then um, we can also look at, so this scenario, for example, we were looking at the risk of phishing currently versus if we were to buy a, you know, female phishing protection response software or whatever, how much would it reduce our risk? So we can kind of look at that. And I'll show an example. I should type in some numbers here. So let's do some random ones of what we get from this model. Okay. So we run our simulation. And again, we're going to simulate this 10,000 times, super easy to do in Excel. And here's what it's going to give us. It's an average annual cost. So basically now what we're doing is putting everything in terms of dollar amounts. And this is when we talk about reporting to the board or the CEO or even sometimes the CISO, right? You need to get things in terms that they can understand. Because you cannot go to a CEO or the board and say we've got a thousand critical vulnerabilities on CVE, whatever. Like they don't understand it and they don't want to. And if anything, it's just going to scare them, right? Or make you think that you're not doing a good job in cybersecurity. What we want to do is go to them is say, Right now, the amount of risk we're taking on in the next year of due to phishing is $302,000. On average, in the next year, that is how much we will lose due to phishing. If we invest in this phishing detection and response offer for 50 k you know, whatever it is, it will lower our cost to $157,000 for an immediate ROI of 2.5. Right? Those are, like, the board understands that. They get, it's just numbers and it's finance. And so that's one reason that, one, this model is a lot more statistically accurate than anything we were doing with risk matrices, right? We're getting rid of that range compression and that analysis placebo. But two, the outputs are actually a lot more helpful and useful to make decisions. Because a risk matrix is never going to tell you the ROI on a product. And they're not going to tell you, you know, the dollar amount loss of the amount of risk you're taking on in the next year. And then we can also look at things like simulated loss histograms. So this means of all of our 10,000 replications, right? How many times did it fall between, you know, zero and, and 20K? How many times is it between, I don't know what those numbers are, but whatever this bucket is. And then, right, the, the bigger it goes, the smaller it is. And then we also get these loss exceedance curves. I'm not gonna get too much into this because I'm already over time, but basically it shows us what was our inherent risk, right? The risk we're taking on before we bought anything. And then what's our residual risk? So how much risk do we have left over if we do buy this tool, or we do, you know, implement whatever initiative we want to do. And we can compare it with what we call our risk tolerance. And risk tolerance is actually defined usually by like the CFO or the CEO of an organization who can say, this is how much risk we are willing to take on. Because you'll always be taking on risk, but how much are you okay with? Are you maybe a large company that's okay with the potential of losing a million dollars in the next year? You probably are, right? Are you a small company and you say, if we get breached and it costs us 50K, we're out of business. So it really varies organization to organization. But just to wrap these up and bring it full circle, I know I didn't get too much into the model, but I'm happy to answer questions later. I just don't have much time. At the end of the day, the biggest kind of feedback I get a lot of times is, okay, but we're still guessing, right? We're just guessing with intervals now instead of one, two, three, four, or five. And to that I say yes, it, it is still a guess. Because again, we have to go back to our actual definition of risk. A risk, just like in life, is something that you don't know the outcome of. So there is no way we can ever perfectly know what day we're going to get breached on. It's in the future. It's unknown. It will always, in theory, be a guess. But it's a better one because now we're using actual statistical models that are meant for uncertainty. They're meant for guesses. And we ourselves are getting, giving better guesses because we've trained ourselves to know how to do that, right? It's all about you know, trying to do things in a better way. We're never going to be perfect, and if that's what we're aiming for, we're always going to fail. But this is something that we can do better to understand our risk. 
Um, the last thing I'll point out is that this is like, I am not reinventing the wheel at all. Uh, the insurance industry, other financial industry have been doing this for like decades. Um, it's the same type of problem in, in, in insurance, right? You don't know if someone's going to get cancer or if they're going to get in a car crash or this and that. So how much do you insure them for and what's their deductible? They use these exact same types of models. I'm not like doing anything super crazy and fancy. All I'm saying is that we should use it in cybersecurity too, right? We're, we're kind of behind the times in that and I think it's because cybersecurity as a whole likes to think that we have these really hard challenges that no one knows how to solve and maybe some of you like hackers and stuff do, but in terms of analyzing data, it's the same thing everyone else has to do and all I'm saying is we should bring this into cybersecurity as an industry. So that's all I have, but um, if you're interested, definitely feel free to reach out or I'll stick around. Um, I, like I said, I know I didn't get too much into the model. Um, also, the FAIR Institute is a really good starting point if you guys are interested in learning more about quantifying cyber risk. I'd look into the FAIR Institute, and there's also a couple books and things I can recommend if you're interested. But other than that, yeah, feel free to connect, and thank you for listening. So real quickly, so that uh, I love that methodology, but is the approach that you might have like a risk register that has like 20 or 30 different in instances where you define what the risk is and then you would apply this to each one of those individually? Is that kind of the intent? Yeah, I mean, it's really however you want to do it. I think that's a good way to approach it. But this can be applied. This is an, a general framework and methodology, so it can be applied to any risk. It's not specific to phishing or the loss of a data breach or anything. So it's all about, as an organization, understanding which risks are important to you and which ones you need to understand better. Because at the end of the day, like my kind of mantra is always knowledge is power, right? Like the more you know, the better decisions you can make. So it's about understanding which risks are we concerned about or which risks do we not know anything about that we just need more information on.